What is it like, the podcast we're approaching? Nothing but B and cult movies, uh, a barren desert of zombie takeout. Welcome to episode 438 of Zombie Takeout. Zombie Takeout. The B-Movie and Cult Movie Show. I'm John. And hello, I'm Scotto. And before we get to this week's movie, we've got some listeners submitted from Bodo. This is on Twitter. He said, first uh, first saw this movie at the drive-in with a little-known movie that played before it called Star Wars. (laughs) Neither one holds up very well. And then a little, you know, emoji with its tongue sticking out. That one I copied in, into my notes. It literally says zany face. Star crash, one brain. And of course, that brings us to this week's movie, which is from 1978, Star Crash. This is our Christopher Plummer tribute. <laughs> Sorry. And of course, <laughs> we may split on this one. I mean, I'm not saying it's good, but it was fun. Um, but of course, that brings us to the impromptu plot summary. Sponsored by bad acting. Sometimes it's really good. Also brought to you by Pew Pew Pew. Try adding that in multicolored starscape to your next disco. Hmm. A multicolored starscape. Yes, a multicolored starscape. Uh, all right, so we have a uh, couple of uh, out- space outlaws on the run. Um, they. Uh, they they stole something, I think. I don't know. I don't know what they did. They, they were just general smuggler types. Yeah, they, they were as vague as possible with the details. They were smuggler types wanted by the cops. Oh, the generic... And, the generic... I guess I can't think of a way. Genericism, I guess is the word. In this movie is ridiculous. Yeah. I have a yeah. direct quote later. <laughs> uh, so they, uh... They're on the run from the cops. They, uh... They unfortunately get caught. Well, actually, no. They ditch the cops, but then they do a good act, and they get caught doing that good act because they find a mm-hmm. an abandoned spaceship and they they rescue the one survivor from the attack on it, and that's when the cops bust them and send them to prison despite doing a good act. Mm-hmm. But then they get sprung out, pretty much wasting a good ten minutes of our time for a prison <laughs> escape, and. Uh, so then they, they get taken back to the Emperor, who uh, sends them on a mission to um, defeat the evil Count, who um, I think has some generic evil plans um, to blow things up. Oh, that's right. The Emperor's son is missing, mm-hmm. and uh, I think they fear the Count has killed him. So they, mm-hmm. they have to search several different ships that he might have been on. Mm-hmm. And they uh, cool. they go through three different planets and face. At, at the beginning of the film, you see what you, turns out to be, you know, the Count's super weapon, which just looks like a giant level lamp. Um, attack. Oh, is that what that was? Yeah. Um, attack the main ship, the, the, the prince's ship. Three smaller ships take off from it. They crash land on different planets. They got to check each one. So they check each one. Uh, they finally find the... Uh, well, after betrayal and uh, people who uh, decide they want vengeance upon these people that they've never met before, mm-hmm. uh, they, uh, they they finally find the prince who just so happens to be on the planet with the emperor, which, yeah. I mean, the count. I kind of felt like we were watching, or that's right, the count, it kind of felt like we were watching the Holy Grail with yeah. like... <laughs> And yeah, as you, it's a grail shaped beacon. We have one yeah. of those. And as you were going through your plot summary, I thought of another good title um, that I hadn't thought of until then. With David Hasselhoff as Prince Kirk. Oh, I I kind of was more partial to Jedi Knight Rider. Because <laughs> he was pulling a Shatner the whole time. He was doing almost a Shatner impression. Yeah, very much so. Well, but then again, is there really a difference between Hoff, Hoff and, Shatner? And, and, and Shatner? That's a fair point. Yeah. I think, I mean, if you go back and look at Knight Rider, he was doing Kirk the whole time. Yeah, true, true. And so, um, let's see. We have um, the the uh, the one pirate, of course, 
uh, happens to be a generic uh, no frills Jedi or mm-hmm. off-brand Jedi right. who <laughs> he keeps pulling out off-brand Jedi powers, you know, including mm-hmm. the laser sword, and uh, he gets hit in the arm, and of course that kills him, and uh, they they the Hoff and and, uh, and and the other are, smuggler and the other smuggler escape the planet. Uh, by by help of the emperor, and uh, the emperor launches an attack without. The emperor is any played by Christopher. Characters. Sorry, the emperor is played by Christopher Palmer. By the way, you need to point that out. That is true. That, that is true. That. Rest in peace. And uh, so, of course, we have this uh, attack that mm-hmm. is another pretty solid waste of time filler just of imagine, just people firing lasers around. Just imagine two kids smashing a bunch of models together and we're making pew pew sounds. <laughs> Right, yeah, pretty much. And then, uh, so that attack fails, and uh, of course, they, they brings us to the lowest point, and it's uh, very obvious, as everything else in the movie is described by an actor, we've lost, it's over, we failed. <laughs> but all is not lost, because, well, they can send a ship pretty quickly over and uh, ram it into the Count's... Uh, Mm-hmm. ship well it's not just a hilarious. ship it's a flying city that they ram into mm-hmm. the count's ship that so. was a flying city huh? oh yeah you're right that yeah. was that, I just thought it was a big ship they refer to it as a city mm. um, that they're going to you know, fly into the count's ship but it's, it's insane but yeah the hilarity ensues yeah. I'm just going to start off with my trivia in an interview with Variety, director Luigi Cozy described Star Crash as science fantasy as opposed to science fiction. Cozy also stated that although people assume Star Crash was an attempt to capitalize on the popularity of Star Wars, the design of the picture and its script were developed prior to Star- the release of Star Wars. The film's producer and screenwriter, Nat Waksberg, and his son, producer Patrick Waksberg, who had developed the American production company Film Enterprises Productions, signed on to the film in May 77, the month Star Wars opened, during the Cannes Film Festival after viewing sample work created by Kazi for investors. Now, I'm not going to say they didn't rip Star Wars off, because I'm sure changes were made after the fact, but I'm actually going to defend the laser sword, because I don't think Lucas was as original as people like to think. Uh, a laser sword's kind of a generic idea. Is it really, though? You know, uh, 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 how many flamed swords do you see in fantasy? Mm. It's just the sci-fi version of that. Well, right. I, I mean, that's the point of it, though. I, mm-hmm. You know, before that, sci-fi and fantasy did not mix. Oh, well, yeah. I'm that, just that is the big thing Lucas did. It was the mixing of the chocolate mm-hmm. and peanut butter together. I, I think that was something that was just ready to happen and a lot of people could have come up with it at the same time. So I'm not saying they were completely innocent. That opening shot is right out of New Hope. That was ripped off. But, but everyone thought Lucas was nuts for doing yeah. it. They, they, so I, I don't think yeah. it was definitely you know, and a person with the means of putting it together. Yeah. Oh, they, yeah. they, were, they all thought he was crazy for mm. doing this. Like, you were going to do Apocalypse Now and said you're going to do this children's yeah. thing? I, I'm, I'm just saying, I believe that the basic idea and a lot of the script was developed before Star Wars just as a similar idea because it was time. Once they got to shooting, they ripped a lot off. <laughs> but yeah, the laser sword, though, is no doubt a, a Star Wars knockoff. Though. I don't know. I think, again, I, I think it was just an obvious idea that Lucas got to first. Um, right, he got to it first. They saw it and said, "Wow, that's cool." Well, and then they. Well, I mean, that's what I'm saying is I don't think they needed to see Lucas do it first. I think it was just an obvious idea that any that anybody making a you know, science fiction movie could have stumbled on. I don't think Lucas was that brilliant when he came up with the lightsaber. Anyway, my other bit of trivia: Plummer said of the filming, "Give me quote, give me room any day." I'll do porno in Rome as long as I can get to Rome. Getting to Rome was the greatest (laughs) thing that happened to me on on that one. I think it was only about three days in Rome on that one. It was all shot at once. Yeah. So he didn't so much do it for the paycheck as he did it for the trip to Rome. Trip to Rome. 
And, you know, he was pretty close to doing a porno, actually, here, wasn't he? <laughs> I'm just going to say straight up, I had a lot of fun with this movie. I'm not saying it was good. <laughs> and we can debate, you know, how much it ripped off Star Wars, but it was fun. I, I think it's insane to say that this wasn't just a Star Wars knockoff. It's it's delusional to, to say this wasn't just... I mean, come on, the name of the film is Star Crash. Yeah. <laughs> it's, but, everything about this is just off-brand Star Wars. But it was so much fun. The you know, the beginning is such an obvious model. It, it, yeah. you know, the camera pans under this long ship. Uh, that would definitely ripped off from New Hope. Um, but it's this obvious glued together model. That was a blast. Yes. Um, I mean, and, these children's models, because mm-hmm. they all the children's models of the day had the little doohickeys kind of like sticking out of it. Right, right. But a, a ship wouldn't really have anyway, of course. But, right. you know. <laughs> and then there's this classic old school credit sequence. We haven't seen one of those in a while. Though it ended weirdly abruptly. And then we get a police robot with a southern accent. Ah, uh, one of my favorite parts of the movie, really. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I mean, taking the other popular movie of the of seventy seven, mm-hmm. Smokey and the Bandit. Right. One of my suggested titles was <laughs> Robo Smokey. And giving this, you know, giving C three PO a southern accent is just just a fucking stroke of genius yeah, yeah. if there ever was one. And. All of the acting in this movie, and, and most of these people are no names, um, except for the lead, uh, the male lead, uh, Marja Gortner, who did a ton in the 70s. I think he went like heavily religious and left acting, but he did a lot in the 70s and early 80s. He was a damn good actor. But I thought, uh, yeah, I thought his work with Lucille Ball in the mirror scene, you know. <laughs> um, but did he become I'll... lead singer of Ario Speedwagon <laughs> by chance? <laughs> All of the acting in this was just brilliantly ham-fisted. Uh, you know, I like the cast of this. As as you know, flat as their acting could be, mm-hmm. it, you know, there isn't much. I mean, it's like uh, it's like last week's. You know, what could yeah. you do with that script? Right. Well, and <laughs> even more so, this this goes to to something we've said a lot with bad movies. They had fun, so we had fun. Yeah. Everybody in this movie knew it was shit. <laughs> Most of them had probably had the same motivation as Plummer. It was a trip to Rome. <laughs> so they just had fun with the shit they were given. Um, when they find the, you know, after they get away from, from L, the, the Robo Smokey, and they find the derelict ship, I, I love how quickly she got into an EV suit and, like, out over to the other ship. Like, within seconds, she goes from, like, a, a swimsuit that she wears for most of the movie <laughs> and gets into this EV suit and is, like, halfway across space to the other ship. And did she... Wasn't L named M when he first was introduced? That was very confusing. I did not catch that. Hmm. I could have sworn they called him Robot M. Huh. And then all of a sudden, he was L. And it was just like, wait, what? <laughs> but... She's even in prison wearing this, like, glorified bikini. Oh, and that was the funniest, because everybody else in the prison has mm-hmm. these robes. They're covered, you know, like, kind to of the like, wrist, Kind to of ankle. like classic sci-fi refugee clothes. Think, like, Bajorans in early DS9. Right. And here she is in, like, her bikini. Mm-hmm. Yeah. <laughs> and the golems, when they're escaping, just wonderfully Harryhausen. That was the other thing. <laughs> it was Star Wars, Smokey, and Harryhausen. Yeah, he did all those classic, like Jason and the Argonauts and all that yeah. great old stop motion stuff. They completely ripped off Harryhausen. The firefight when they escaped was just so wonderfully disjointed. <laughs> <laughs> that is where, uh, man, my problem with most of this movie is Anytime they attempted an action scene, mm-hmm. and of course you're, you're thinking, well, you know, the action is supposed to be the thrill, but oh. you really couldn't tell a single thing that was going on. I think I might be at a slight advantage because I saw this on MST3K, you know, a while back. So I knew what to expect. I knew to come into it like just, just for a laugh. You know, I had well, no course. higher expectations. 
I, I mean, I'm, I'm in it for a laugh too, but the the action scenes just would get boring after a while because mm. it was just random pews and yeah. <laughs> you just got, you know, the the funny ones were would be when they actually had the actors describe right. the action that was taking yeah, place yeah. that you're supposed to be able to see as if it were a radio mm-hmm. drama, but they knew what they were filming made no sense whatsoever. And I think it's ironic that they one of the characters, uh, Marjorie Gortner's character, was named Acton. Why? Uh, oh, <laughs> it's spelled A K T O N. But yeah, Acton is naming one of the characters in this movie. Acton was funny. Speaking of the acting, Plummer comes in with this incredibly, you know, understated, pitch perfect performance because he's Plummer, yes. <laughs> and it's just this really funny contrast. Although my favorite part uh, for Plummer is to, at the end where Hoff sees him and he's like, father. And he responds by, by nodding. Mm-hmm. Like, yes, I am your father. <laughs> <laughs> that, that had me, yeah. that had me almost fall out of a chair. <laughs> but like 20 minutes in, I'm, I, I have a note. I'm already in love with this movie. Um, and this is a little bit of a twist on a lot of movies we've covered because we've done a lot of, you know, hero's journey nonsense. And there's always the father quest. This was right. the son quest. True. Hmm. Loved the explosive hyperspace effect. The, the go to hyperspace, of course, yes, borrowed from Star Wars. Yeah. Um, Although I think the the sub this closed caption had she said Hydra space first <laughs> or wow. Hydra space. But there's this, like, paint, um, you know, uh, what's the word I'm looking for, um, effect, where, like, you just paint pl- splatter, that's it. There's this, like, paint splatter effect when they go to hyperspace. It's hilarious. It was kind of a weird metallic version of the Batman TV series fights. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> that's perfect. Um, just blammo. Mm-hmm. <laughs> And then there's the Amazons. The first planet they go to is populated by Amazons. Uh, Stella, the female lead, has the female smuggler has to fight the Amazons. And they begin by saying, "We will take our vengeance." Mm. <laughs> I'm like, wait a minute! They've never met these people before. Yeah, yeah. And the <laughs> queen seems badly dubbed for some reason. I think there were a lot of Italian actors. In oh, this. that's entirely possible. Yeah. I think um, there were a lot of people that were, were trying to do the best American right. that they could. Um, the fight choreography, though, between Stella, Stella and the Am- Am- Amazons was hilarious. Yes. <laughs> and then, you know, she's escaping with Elle, Robo Smokey, across the, the landscape to get back to the ship. And this giant titan comes to life, this giant robot. It is just, just there. <laughs> yeah. And it was just standing there as a statue. It comes to life. It was pure Jason of the Argonauts, but like with a right. little bit of a sci fi skin. It was just, we're going to send this after them. And then he's just suddenly there. And it's kind of like, yeah. oh, look at that. Mm. <laughs> it's like, oh, man. This movie is paced like a late 70s cop show. Yes. That's what, exactly what it feels like. Um, I, I did appreciate that it took a snow planet to get Stella to wear more than a bathing suit. I was surprised they didn't do the see-through thing yeah, there. Yeah. I mean, it came later, but, you know. Mm-hmm. Yeah, they basically go to Hoth um, two years before, so they couldn't rip that off. <laughs> right, but, right. Yeah, she, she has to wear a parka. Of course, the minute she's back in the ship after that, it's back to the bathing suit. Um, and we have the villain turn that surprised no one, Thor. Um, <laughs> El, the Robo Smokey's underling, turned into the villain. He was working for the Count. Um, the fight choreography between Thor and Acton wasn't much better, but of course, you know, then we find out that Acton is suddenly a Jedi. Yes. He starts doing like an Obi Wan impression too after this fight. Hmm. And then they have to cross, and they didn't explain this at the beginning. Uh, when you see the big ship at the beginning, the count or the prince's ship, it just gets hit with this like lava lamp effect. You don't know what it is. <laughs> then they explain that it's the count's weapon. It, this you know, you know, intense you know, 
ship destroying weapon that the count has that really just looks like a red lava lamp and just inflicts pain on everybody on board this really needs to be a midnight movie yeah definitely you know um i i would love to see it you know in a theater with a bunch of other people at midnight the cavemen seemed like a random choice but probably Very made much. more sense than anything else in the movie because here are these you know people trying to invade their land of course now, they're gonna be pissed i think a lot of things they used here were just leftover things mm-hmm. from other movies probably. like you know the they, the golden helmets were and the black helmets that you know were just gold helmets painted right. black with like the stripe on top mm-hmm. that they, they were clearly just from a gladiator movie right. of some sort mm-hmm. and so yeah they were just gathering different things um I was when they thawed her after the Hoth scene. I was kind of expecting the butterscotch pudding from the terror. I was kind of disappointed <laughs> we didn't get that. But mm-hmm. now somehow they put her in this room that had you know two big open doors, like open doorways that they could you know just walk right into the room, even though they needed to put her in this special room. And then somehow Acton held up his hands and thawed her. <laughs> but. On the caveman planet, uh, L gets destroyed. Seeing his electronics was interesting because, you know, they beat him to death and you actually do see bits of stray electronics, you know, sticking out of his limbs. wonder what they used. Just random bits of electronics they cannibalized right. from whatever was sitting around, I'm sure. Kitchen appliances, I'm sure. Mm-hmm. And the caveman camp, some reason made me think of Python. <sighs> Not sure why, but... Where do the cavemen get steel beams from? That's a good question. Maybe they took them from the ship that crashed. (laughs) Carry her out on these two big steel beams. And then you don't see the steel beams again. They put her in these, like, wooden things. Mm. Yeah. And and when they get to the planet where it all goes down, you know, where the prince is, um, she talks about pre-programmed computers or how, you know, they were powering everything. I couldn't help thinking of programmable virtual reality. (laughs) I was thinking of Breed, too. Um, Was there a Commodore that was pre-programmed, too? I Uh forget which one. Right. Before the 64. Yeah, yeah. it's not really that big of a deal. It's like programmable virtual reality. Um, I didn't notice, surprisingly, all of the guy liner on Hoff and Gortner until they confronted the Count. (laughs) And, And to describe the Count... Um, if you've ever played Katamari Damacy, think of the king of the universe mixed with the ma- the old school master, like, you know, 70s, 80s master from Doctor Who. Or if you don't know Katamari Damacy, just take that master, you know, the, the Baker era, and just make him super flamboyant. Well, yeah, I think even almost as much as Star Wars had an influence on this, that they were channeling Doctor Who. Yeah, and a lot of this because you know act on you know I, I felt a very strong Baker kind of feel mm-hmm. about him and, from and the look you yeah know, the doctor to just the act the doctor even in the modern era does tend to randomly pull out powers at the drop of the hat right so yeah they were kind of doing that only he had the uh, the outfit for a Medi Murphy from Raw years before somehow yeah, yeah. um. I think the Count, spooning back to him for a minute, may have been yes. the second best actor in the movie. <laughs> he wasn't That's bad. not saying a whole lot. He was very arch. He was kind. He was a bit Combs, but he was, you know, he could act. Um, though he did really like his evil laughs. He, he leaned yes. heavily into those. And I love the, um, the whole, he couldn't just not do anything during the battle. He had to be, kill that one. Yeah. Get that one. <laughs> And, a micromanager. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Um, although there is one part that I think Lucas may have stolen. We have, you know, um, Acton with, with the laser sword going against these two um, basically very gangly robots, the the, Gorga, the, the, the golems. It, it was very, you know, lightsaber versus battle droid. Hmm. Speaking of sword play, Hoff looked good with the sword. Yes. He yes, knew he how did. to swing a sword. I was very surprised by that. 
Um, you must have. Do you think Hoff actually studied acting? Like took stage combat classes or something? Oh, I, he probably did. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I wouldn't be surprised at all. Because I mean, it was straight out of like a stage combat class, but he he did it well. Yeah, you know, he he's a guy who really wanted to be a star and That's was true. going to do whatever it took. Yeah, yeah. Um, he probably did study. So yeah, he just he learned his, his uh, stage combat. Um, the shot from behind the emperor on his ship when they're looking at the big view screen, very trip to the moon. Oh yeah, the whole that whole scene with them up on the deck, just I I don't understand any of that. Why that had to be that yeah, way. Yeah. What they, the effect was they were going for? They just had this shot that looked a lot like a trip to the moon. It looked cool. They liked it. Um, when Acton does die because he got shot in the shoulder. Yes. Uh, Stella says, I don't understand. You never die. <laughs> I mean, he hadn't died until then. but Right. Um, of course. The disappearing act or effect was interesting too because it it goes very eighties for a second. Instead of just the disappearance, like Obi Wan, he has to have some color and yeah. some. I just wish I had a laser that could stop time for three minutes. <laughs> that was the most egregious, you know, plot armor. <laughs> oh yes. Um, they, they they polish off, you know, the, the Count's forces on the planet. And the whole thing is that the planet's going to explode. They've lured the Emperor there. They're going to kill everybody. And of course, the, there's a nice Scott Evil moment in there where, he, you know, they're all surrounding three people. Mm -hmm. And they could just kill them all right. right there and go. But instead, they have two people guarding three. Yeah. <laughs> But of course, the the emperor shows up. He, you know, he can, he's going to extract everybody and get everybody to safety. But they say, you know, the planet's about to explode, and he just says he has this time stopping ray that'll stop time for three minutes so they can get away. And they just barely made it. Of course, like I don't think they were tight really far enough away when it blew. No. It, and then I just have another note about Plummer's performance because it really was the cherry on the top of this thing. Uh, the one part that did make the space battles interesting, at least mm -hmm. towards the end, it I don't know if it was just me, but did it seem like they were using some sex toys there? <laughs> Probably were. Um, <laughs> and I loved the soft 70s flute music behind this epic battle. I, I mean, the pew, 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 but the, you know, the little yeah. you know, golden bullet. And, yeah. uh, <laughs> but there's... You know, <laughs> Almost like 70s love theme music behind this big battle. Like, I, I loved it. Um, and here's the quote I have. We got, uh, the generic quote. Put in use our mightiest weapon, the Doom Machine. Send it off toward the Emperor's capital world and destroy the Emperor's imperial planet. They couldn't have bothered to name the planets or the world. Right. <laughs> and, and they just called the weapon the Doom Machine. <laughs> And, and, you know, he gives that speech, you know, we've lost, it's over, with 10 minutes left. So, of course, it wasn't over. Right. At 1.19.55, Plummer says the name of the film <laughs> yes. as part of this batshit plan to ram a floating city into the Count's ship. Robo Smokey is back because the king, the, the Emperor's people were able to save him. And then we get some music that's dangerously close to TOS. <laughs> Surprised they didn't rip more off from TOS. You would think. You would think. Other than a little bit of music. Uh, it was almost forgotten at that point. You yeah, know, yeah but... that's true. Um, and then the evacuation scene from the Count ship gave me space balls feels. Oh, yes. I think Mel Brooks used a lot of this movie. Oh, yeah. For space balls, uh -huh. and I just loved the count standing there yelling at people and em yelling at an empty room as his ship blows up around him. <laughs> right. What was that even yelled anyway? I don't remember exactly, but yeah, it's I think I don't have nonsense. Yeah, I don't. I think I don't have it written down because it didn't make any sense. Um, and then you know they all get on the ship at the end, and it's all it's all everybody's safe, and um, 
uh, I can't think of her name. The one, the female lead. Um, Stella. Stella. Thank you. Stella and the prince start flirting with each other, and Elle is just standing in there as a third wheel for like five seconds, reacting very emphatically. Yeah. Oh, <laughs> very very awkwardly. That was hilarious. And then we get Plummer's ending monologue, which yes. is just perfect. <laughs> I mean, he's phoning it in, but Plummer phoning it in is still pretty damn brilliant. I mean, he only had, like, what, five scenes in the whole movie, if you think about it? He, well, he really... Yeah. Three, only three where he really acted. Yeah. like So this was a really nice mm-hmm. paycheck trip to Rome. Right. But he just lays it on so thick in this closing monologue about how, you know, there will always be hope in all of this. <laughs> A new hope, if yeah, you will. Yeah. Uh-huh. And then <laughs> the closing credits. Okay, this movie felt so like late seventies, early eighties TV that yeah. I half expected to see bloopers during the credits. I was disappointed that there were no bloopers. That would have that would have bought this some. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> On to sequels and remakes. Same note as last week. No, because it's perfect as it is. I, I mean, unless it's like John Waters doing it or something. Yeah, yeah okay. Yeah. If <laughs> Neil Breen wants to remake more this. Obvious. Yeah. If Waters or Breen wants to remake this, okay. <laughs> On to Brains. On to Brains. I fucking loved it. I, I went five again. I enjoyed it, but uh, there's so many scenes that just kind of bore the hell out of you. Uh, there, there are also a lot of funny scenes in it, though, so I'm giving it a three. All right, and what have we learned? Those outfits, those leather outfits, should have been burned at the <laughs> completion of this film. There were so many people just wearing nothing but leather, and it was like, or pleather, mm-hmm. that they just had to have been so chafed. Yeah. Well, I'm sure there was plenty of Vaseline on the set uh, with all those oh, sex You toys. gotta hope. You gotta hope. <laughs> and I learned that train wrecks can happen in space. <laughs> and they make a whoosh yeah. noise <laughs> and they're very colorful and that's it for Star Crash until two weeks from now uh, we're off next week for my birthday um, speaking of which uh, my birthday is a week from the day you're first hearing this Thursday um, and I'm going to be posting tomorrow Thursday on our social media my birthday recommendation list it's a list I put together every year an update every year uh, of various media media that I really like and that I want to share with people. I just love, you know, curating media and sharing it, turning people on into good stuff. So I put that out every year kind of as an, the ask is, you know, for my birthday, just, you know, check, find something on the list that looks interesting and check it out. Um, so that'll be going up tomorrow. And in two weeks, we'll be reviewing Crawl, kicking oh, off a, <laughs> a fantasy quadrilogy. I almost had to tap out of that one because I, re- I looked it up on IMDb and there's this, only photos are mo- the model makers creating this big spider. <laughs> I read through the summary. He's, it's only in one scene. I watched the scene. It's actually not that bad. So I will be in right. on this one. I don't think we we're going to have a legitimately good movie until maybe May. <laughs> what? You don't think cats are satisfaction? Or... Oh, we didn't announce that yet, did we? No, no, we haven't. Um, you know, cat, you know, cat is literally out of the bag now. Um, our April Fool's Day episode this year, we're pranking ourselves again. It's going to be cats. Um, we had to review it at some point. Why not do it for an April Fool's Day episode? And yeah, we I mean, we haven't pulled anything like a lie or anything in so long. So yes, no, we no. Yeah. are truly going to do it. Yeah, we're actually reviewing cats this year. As you can hear the resignation in my voice. Mm-hmm. <laughs> it's like and mine. That's a fact. Uh, and so then, of course, always remember, never forget, wherever you go in life, there you are. There you are. Hello, and welcome to episode 343. Sorry. <laughs> what are you doing? I caught myself that time. I'll take the whole thing again. <laughs>